further ado, I'm going to leave the, the floor to Chris. Thank, Thank you very much. much. It's a real pleasure and an honour to be here talking to the FDA today. Um, my first slide uh, is to show you how important the, um, the ocean is to where we live. And I'm afraid I have to turn around to point at it. Uh, this shows you surface temperature. The brown is warm water uh, over here in the Pacific, the, the blue cold water. And you can see that the main source to the Arctic is coming from the Atlantic and not from the Pacific. Relatively little warm water comes in from the Pacific. And the same applies to salinity. Nearly all the salt is coming in. The Pacific is a, a brackish water ocean in, in comparison. So this is really important to, to where we live and it's why we are much warmer in the UK than anywhere else. My talk's about climate change and I'm uh, put four slides up here. These are decadal slides that are based on the mean of 1951 uh, to 1980, averaged against that. And so anything that is yellow or red on there is more, uh, more than it was in the previous period of time. And you can see, sorry, you can see <coughs> that the first decade here, there's a lot of yellow. By the second decade, the average, you're starting to see warming in the western Antarctic and further north. And then in the next decade, a huge increase in the northern latitudes. And the next decade, almost up to now, an even greater increase with polar amplification in the Arctic region. And this shows you where we are since the uh, first started taking records in the, 18, uh, in, in the 19th century. Uh, right at the bottom, all the blue ones here. And gradually, you, this is a seasonal cycle average for the whole of the world from January to December. Look at what has happened in the last couple of years. The difference between where these are, especially in the uh, winter months of the year and the autumn and spring, is much greater than it has been in previous time. The wor world is warming up, particularly at this time of the year. But see the difference in 19, uh, 2019 compared to 2018. Things are accelerating in the world. And this is uh, partly the reason for it. There is an, a, an imbalance in the energy that is coming in from the sun. <coughs> sun the light comes in from the sun uh, as a shortwave, visible light. I, I try and think of it as a caterpillar that is going up and down quickly. Uh, for short wave, whereas uh, long wave, it spreads out a bit more. Um, and so it comes in, sorry about this, it comes in a short wave visible light, and, and this is transparent to, to the light. Because it, the sun is so hot, this it produces a hell of a lot of energy uh, that is hitting the world, and especially the oceans is 71% of the world. And uh, it uh, part of it is then reflected through infrared radiation, uh, long wave radiation. Uh, certain gases in the atmosphere uh, are, um, which we'll come on to in a minute, uh, can hold back this energy, forming like a blanket, uh, the greenhouse effect. So some of that energy is reflected back to the earth and that is what is eating up the world. But 93% of the energy that is coming in is taken up by the ocean. And the whole of the world is complete, doesn't know that this, this is the case. Only 1% is warming the atmosphere, and it's that 1% that we are seeing causing global warming to humans. 4% uh, approximately is taken up in melting ice, uh, and 2% to warm up the uh, atmosphere. So, next slide. Sorry, can I have the, over here you'll see some of the reasons why the ocean is so important. So that projector over there is just, if you want to read some text uh, while you're looking at the rest of the thing, it, it's over there for you to have a look at, um, to give some explanation. Um, a, a great proportion of that heat is taken up by the ocean, as I have said. And uh, I'm getting used to this. Uh, it's increasingly being taken up by the ocean in, and to the extent that it's now penetrating right down into the very deep ocean this dark blue area here and this shows this small percentage is taken up by the by the atmosphere in red at the bottom 
look how much has gone into the ocean. And it's getting more and more every year. And now we're seeing some evidence of some of that heat coming out. When you realise that only 1% has warmed the atmosphere, if 1% suddenly came back out of the ocean, it would have an astronomical effect to the temperature of the atmosphere. We've got a time bomb potentially there that uh, most people do not uh, understand uh, at all. And um, the next, and here again to demonstrate how important the ocean is. It's the beating heart of our world, and uh, uh, I'm e e extremely grateful that this uh, slide was, this projection was drawn to my attention uh, because um, it's a great illustration of how important the Earth is. You can see the seasonal cycle. Here is Antarctica, here is the North Pole. It's a projection to demonstrate how big the ocean is. Over 71% of our world is taken up by the ocean. And when you realize that 93% of the heat has gone into that, it gives you some idea of how important it is. And you, sorry. And draw your attention particularly, the white is the warmer water on here. And you can see as part of the beating heart, this is the Pacific Ocean. You can see how it is penetrating from the uh, western side of the Pacific Ocean and moving over to the east to heat up <coughs> Central America here and the United States and then to spread up the coast on either side. And it's part of what uh, we, you're, you're seeing it here as an, an event that is a, a seasonal event, average seasonal event is shown on the slide here. But we see changes uh, which happen over approximately uh, four to five to seven years called El Nino, when you get a reinforcement of this pattern of heat. So heat that has been accumulating in the western side of the Pacific is suddenly splurged all the way across the Pacific to the other side. And these events that have uh, enormous impacts on, on our world. And we saw one of them that occurred in 2015. And the warm weather that we've been having virtually ever since 2015 was partly because of that El Nino event and heat coming back out of the ocean. We're seeing these events occurring more frequently. Uh, and that is another possible impact from climate change, from global warming. Uh, move on. Right. Carbon dioxide, a tiny part of our atmosphere that, that we breathe. 78% uh, 70, uh, of the atmosphere is made up by nitrogen. And uh, a, the next is... Uh, oxygen, which is really important to us, that allows humans and all other animals to, uh, to be able to breathe. Uh, and uh, water vapour, hugely important. Water vapour is also a greenhouse gas, but it's not like the other gases because it is dependent on temperature. So as it gets warmer, there is more water vapour in the air. And so it changes from zero in virtually in some parts of the world to almost 4%. Uh, on here, uh, I have shown it as 2%. So this is, you could take this, this is a percentage, and you could take it as being one metre or one litre of water, it doesn't make any difference, uh, but the little red dots on here are carbon dioxide, a tiny proportion of the whole, and a weeny part made up of other gases, some of which are also greenhouse gases. But that tiny part of the air that we breathe is what is causing everything. Because not only is it uh, acting uh, as a blanket uh, to keep heat back down on, uh, near the surface of the earth, but it, it is also reinforcing the effect uh, of water, which you can see in the next slide. So here is where we're at at this moment in time, as of October last. We're now at 408 parts per million. And as you can see, since uh, back here in the 19th century, as carbon dioxide 
uh, and the other long-lived greenhouse gases are being getting greater. Most of this green is made up of carbon dioxide. As they've been getting greater, so the water content of the world's atmosphere has been increasing. And this is where it could be in the future if we went up to 700 parts per thousand. There would be a, water vapour would be having a really big impact on, on our climate. Um, and this is what's the primary culprit. Uh, the long, wonderful time series from 1958 at Mauna Loa in the, in the, um, in, in the Hawaii's. Uh, you can see the seasonal cycle going up and down every year. As the leaves are falling off the trees, uh, and um, uh, as the leaves are falling off the trees, the, uh, it has a big impact on the concentration of carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere as, uh, as we move into winter. And we're, we're seeing that here, right up at the very top. See, it's coming back down again here, the level. But it will come up again as uh, plant growth gets going again, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. Because in the Northern Hemisphere, we've got much more land than anywhere else. Although, of course, phytoplankton in the sea is also important. And that pattern, you saw a seasonal pattern there, but we can also measure the levels of carbon dioxide in ice cores that have been taken in Greenland and Antarctica. And here you see one of the first ones from the Epica core. Uh, and you, in red here, is where we're at now, in the Holocene. So here, we, if you really want to project this temperature now, it's probably somewhere up here, near the yellow, um, if, if you updated this to, to present day conditions. We're probably warmer now, or he heading towards being warmer, than the Eemian, which was the last interglacial. So this is an glaci uh, interglacial period, and you've got an alternation of these in the ice core going back through time to about 800,000 years ago. We know that it goes back much further than that. Um, next one. Um, and this is the first modelling result. If I could move, I think, onto the next slide on here. Um, this is the first modelling result from uh, the International Panel, no, or one of the modelling results from the International Panel on Climate Change. I was using this slide probably 20 years ago, um, it, certainly uh, in, in the uh, uh, round about 2004, 2005, when it first came out from uh, the International Panel on Climate Change. And I've added to it where the levels of of uh, carbon dioxide have been in subsequent years. It is tracking the uppermost level of the different scenarios for, that have been produced by the International on Climate Change. The red line is the maximum scenario from IPCC. And it's the same now. We are still tracking this highest level. Uh, and that's business as usual. And we've virtually got business as usual in the world at the moment. Uh, and that shows you where we were in 2011, actual measurements. That's where we were in 2017. And we know that we're, on, we're definitely going to be over uh, 10 uh, gigatons of carbon per year for 2018, and probably even more in 2018. So we're not really doing very much to reduce the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, despite the impact that it is having. Um, this is from the, um, the, uh, the carbon project showing the, uh, the amount, sorry, showing the <coughs> contributions from industry and from land use. Here, 10.9 uh, gigatons of carbon per year. And this is where it appears to be going. 43% going into increasing the level of the atmosphere, 29% on an annual basis, 29% into the land sink, and 24% with a residual, almost a good chance that a better part of that is actually going into the ocean as well. And we've known about the problem for a, virtually since the 19th century. Arrhenius here, 
appear. In 1896, first calculated on an understanding of that carbon dioxide was really important, uh, Eunice Foote, a lady, was the first person to recognize, to actually demonstrate experimentally that carbon dioxide could lead to warming of the atmosphere, uh, followed up by Tyndall. Uh, Arrhenius, in 1896, actually calculated that uh, what would happen with a doubling of temperature, and it, he was surprisingly correct. There's a hell of a lot of information on this slide. I wanted to show you how much has been said, and this is only a tiny fraction of what has been said about carbon dioxide and its impact uh, on the world, and uh, uh, right back to the 19th century. Um, key people, Alistair Hardy. I'll now put on the next thing. We have very few long time series to be able to demonstrate what is happening in the world. We're lucky that we can go back into these ice cores. But um, one of the very first is our continuous plankton recorder survey, which is homed, which is home, has its home here in this laboratory. And I put Hardy in, while he didn't really talk about climate change, it was data from this survey that provided the first evidence of an impact on the oceans from climate change. The, the, the movement to the north, well I'll show you a slide in a minute about that. Uh, come back to that then. Uh, other key people in here are Plass in 1956, clear link between CO2 and temperature. Um, Magda, I'll show you some of his modeling work, first person to produce a mathematical model in a minute. James Hansen, if anybody should be a Nobel Prize winner, it's James Hansen. He has campaigned for climate change and that we should do something about it right back to the beginning of his career. Other key people, Bolin uh, uh, and others. The Pope, in his encyclical, he's been talking to people from the oil industry and telling them that they really need to do something. Uh, and I put uh, Corinne Lecoeur, 2018, uh, she's doing a great job in compiling all the data that uh, is heading that group uh, on carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, which goes into the mathematical models. There are many other people that could go in, into this, and it's, a, it's an unfinished slide, this. There's still a lot of work to be done on it. Next one. Sorry. And uh, here you see some of the publications that have been produced, all those yellows. It first was drawn to attention really in the United States way back in 1966, but that was a decade after Plass had been talking about it. It took a decade for people in the United States to actually produce a report, and it wasn't a very convincing one. It was another decade before the next report here uh, really hammered home the message of how, how how crucial it was that we do something about carbon dioxide. Uh, and then the, uh, eventually we get round to having uh, an international panel on climate change, right up here, 1988. And I really wasn't very aware of the impact of climate change round about this time. I was more focused on the North Sea uh, and oceanography. I wasn't thinking so much about, uh, and I know that government really wasn't at that time either. Uh, and, and then there's been a whole range of subsequent, thousands of pages of scientific evidence to prove, and yet our politicians are not, our governments are not recognising how crucial the impact is. Um, and if anything, and people don't believe models, if, if anything, these early models and their projections proved, to my mind, that we can really rely on the results of the models and their projections for our future. This was Macter in 1971. He actually had this data here measured and he had a, a projection back through time of where, what the levels of carbon dioxide were from other scientific information. And he, he projected that by 2000, it was going to be 369.55 parts per million. Uh, his graph ended 
at three and sorry, he, he projected it was going to be 380 approximately, a bit lower than that. Hard to tell. Whereas the actual projection, the actual level that was measured in, for the world is 369.55 at Mauna Loa. And given that, that, that we're growing up by approximately three parts per million in the last year, I don't think that's too bad to be out by three years uh, as a projection. And then another, I, I emphasize again, the key the contribution by James Hansen uh, to understanding the science. And he's still doing it. Um, and this was his first model published in science in 1981. Um, Amazingly, he was thinking about synthetic fuels. And he's, he's the first person to produce these different scenarios, to my knowledge. And it may be, there may be others, but to my knowledge, he's the first person to have done this. Uh, and he has a, a non-fossil re, uh, replacement fuels coming in. But he, he, uh, this is the lowest level that he, he's produced. Uh, and this, this is the highest, the fast growth. And he then was saying that we were going to be hitting the sort of temperatures that were around in the Mesozoic um, uh, uh, on, on his, uh, up to four degrees. I think he was a little out on, on that. But look where, if you add into his diagram, where the GIFs data is actual, ob de ob not decadal, these are actual observations, 10 years apart. Uh, and 2016 is that one there, and 2018 slightly lower uh, to the right of it. All above his maximum in the modelling. And here, another 10 years later in 1988, approximately 10 years later, another far more sophisticated model. And if I can come back to here, thank you. Um, some of the key predictions from his model on, on the screen on the right. But again, look how accurate his prediction was in relation to where we were. 2018. This is a three-dimensional model uh, of the atmosphere and the ocean. But the ocean was... Uh, the, uh, the ocean was quite a simplified ocean. It didn't show any variability from year to year. Um, this is where the red dots are where... It, there were three different scenarios here. One with CO2 forcing, one with trace gases added as well as carbon dioxide, and the other with uh, carbon dioxide. He calls them trace gases. These are other, leaf, other greenhouse gases uh, and aerosols. So uh, particles in the atmosphere that can have quite a big impact. And he gets the best result when you combine all three together. Um, and it's a one degree increase by about 2015. Um, and I think that is really solid evidence that we have excellent proof uh, that global warming is real and it will have a huge impact on us. And this is a, um, a, another model showing you um, where we would be in Plymouth. This goes back again quite a long time, this model, about 2003 up to four degrees warmer. We're going to have temperatures like Barcelona. Uh, and it's all down to global, to GDP. Uh, carbon per capita emissions here, and uh, on a log scale, uh, GDP per capita. And the UK is here. I've just come back from a period in, in Ireland where they also gave a lecture, and I was particularly looking at this. To my astoundment, Ireland has a much higher GDP uh, than the UK. And it also has a much greater problem with greenhouse gases. And it's not doing anything much about it, despite being a member of the EU. Some of the impacts that have occurred. Well, we're seeing <coughs> enormous uh, increases in primary production in some parts of the world. Uh, we're seeing uh, increased growth in the northern parts of the world. Uh, a uh, increase in primary production which is almost proportional to levels of carbon dioxide uh, regime shifts have been taking place 
And this one in roughly 1987, I think is absolutely crucial. I think this is what set the scene for all the big changes that we're seeing. It's since then that we've seen a lot of the big changes. This is snow cover in the Northern Hemisphere. And the one at the bottom is phytoplankton color from the Continuous Plankton Recorder Survey. And it's this that has provided some of the first evidence. Plus we see this 1,000 kilometer uh, movement of warmer water plankton off the UK, uh, which uh, is clear evidence of warmer water getting further north. Um, and the first evidence, and the very sad thing is that at this moment in time, we are, thank goodness, changing to it, that the CPR will now start to operate again out into the Atlantic Ocean. But because of the difficulties that the survey went through, uh, the B route and other routes out into the Atlantic were stopped because of lack of funding from the government and other sources. It, this is madness. If there's anybody from the government here, it's absolute madness. This, this survey was providing the first clear evidence of climate change, and yet it's not being funded adequately. We need long-term time series. And it's great to know that we are starting the B route again, but the money still is not there for it, so we need somebody to provide that money. Um, coral reefs are suffering throughout the world. The Great Barrier Reef, the latest report just come out, is being downgraded to very poor. 50% of the coral has uh, redu reduced between 85 to 2012. This wonderful part of the world is really suffering at the moment because of increasing temperatures and particularly because of coral bleaching. Um, moving into the cryosphere, if I can get on here to the cryosphere. Um, Greenland, the ice sheets, huge loss this last July. Uh, there's been a progressive decline in the ice sheets. 2012, a major uh, melt event, and another one here in 2019, almost certainly. Uh, it's not just Greenland, but we're seeing the same thing happening in Antarctica. Look at the huge change through time in the amount of ice that has been lost from Antarctica. And in both Greenland and Antarctica, the vast majority of the ice is disappearing around the edges where the ice sheets are in contact with the oceans. It's warmer water from the oceans that is largely melting the ice. And that's got a real potential problem for Antarctica because you've got ice shelves coming out because of the weight of the ice the same thing happens in Greenland because of the weight of the ice it has submerged the crust of the earth and water is coming warmer water from the ocean is coming in underneath the ice shelves melting the ice and it's only got to get to this crucial point here and it will start to move down the slope the warm water down here and the whole of the ice sheet could become destabilised and then we see a really dramatic increase in sea level, if that happens. Unfortunately, the mathematical models are still not good enough to be able to tell us whether this is going to happen or not. Took this photograph in 2013, the biggest glacier in Europe. You can see the little dots here. These are a line of men uh, coming across, tied together, um, where the, just, just here. Uh, look at... See this area of clean rock here without any vegetation on it? That's the ice that has vanished. This ice sheet has retreated from the snout by two miles. A phenomenal change in that, the biggest ice sheet. Methane, a huge potential greenhouse gas. It uh, covers 42% of Eurasia a huge potential source of greenhouse gas uh, because it, uh, as it is melting, it is releasing methane from organic material that is included. And it, uh, Katie Walters demonstrates this very clearly uh, here in Alaska where you can drill a hole in the ice over the top of a lake and you can put a match to it and that's methane coming out. Every time in the spring when that ice melts, the methane is going straight up into the atmosphere. And there's also a phenomenal amount of methane in, um, in underneath the ocean bed um, it, it, in, uh, fr in frozen form. 
which is also potentially being, being released. And recently, uh, there was a paper in, in, uh, on Greenland uh, showing that melt water has also got high, very high concentrations of methane coming out uh, as the ice is melting. Sea level rise. This is the, again, different scenarios. This is the maximum scenario for sea level rise. And if we make the comparisons between the maximum scenarios previously, then we're heading for at least a 2.5 meter sea level rise by 2100. And you can imagine what the impact of that. It doesn't look at the moment as if that is what will happen. Hopefully, it won't happen. But even if we had a one meter rise in sea level, it would have a phenomenal impact on our societies. And this is from a, a book that I produced in 2011, uh, showing what would happen to Belgium with a one meter rise in sea level. So you can imagine what would happen with a 2.5 uh, metre rise, the impact it would have. Uh, we know that sea level rise is accelerating. Uh, it's at the top of the uh, projections of the International uh, of, uh, Panel on Climate Change. It's tracking global sea surface temperatures, which are also going up very rapidly. And it's... The real problem is the potential of instability from the ice sheets. What would happen if they were? Uh, and there are other impacts. Another impact from uh, the rising temperatures here shows what happens when it gets really hot. It's been over 50 degrees in some parts of the world this summer and you can you can hardly exist at that you're getting to the level depending on temperature and humidity what they are there are many parts of the world where it's getting impossible to live in without being able to cool things down and the Qatar marathon championship many of the contestants weren't able to to finish it's not too surprising when you see where what the temperature was when they were when they were doing it they should not be holding a marathon when you see that plot at that time. And this is where the World Cup final is going to be. And you know what they've done for the World Cup final? they put uh, air conditioning under the seats. Well, that's not going to help greenhouse warming, is it? Global warming. Um, and uh, other impacts, enormous uh, effects from um, extreme events. Um, my partner's in, uh, in Sydney at the moment. And the a catastrophe, or the whole way around, has been declared the whole way around Sydney. There, is, there, there are fires where I used to go swimming when I was in Sydney. Uh, and uh, here is the Hurricane Doria. Huge impact on the insurance industry. All caused by this increase in temperature and the higher content of water in our atmosphere. Well, where, where can we go? into the future. This is from some suggestions from the United Nations on what we can do. Five minute showers, drive less, I won't, I won't say them all, but uh, huge, problems, huge problems with uh, the clothes that we wear. Try and make your clothes last a lot longer and uh, use second hand material if you can. And uh, unplug your electricity, some great ideas there. Uh, where's, how is the UK doing in relation to the emissions? Well, we are extremely fortunate that we've got a climate change committee in the UK. They're doing a phenomenal job. And look at their website and see some of the things that they've been doing and some of the recommendations that they've been making to government. Many of them are being taken up by the government, but they're not moving fast enough. Our government is not moving fast enough. Uh, there's been a huge reduction through time in the emissions of carbon dioxide. But when you look at these, it's virtually all from energy supply. Energy supply because we've moved into using uh, energy from windmills, uh, from uh, uh, use of waste products um, to, to, uh, to produce energy uh, and, uh, and other sources. So that we and we've got rid of our heavy industry. Uh, as a result of that, the UK has been doing 
supposedly really well. But we come back to that later. Uh, and people have been patting themselves on the back, but we're not doing anywhere near as much. Transport has hardly changed at all. If you go into here, look, there's been no change at all since 1990. We should have been reducing our emissions from that, through that time. Business, slight, slight reduction. Residential, hardly any change either. Uh, agriculture, again, constant throughout the whole of the period. And you've got countries like Ireland, where I've just been, where there's been a 5% uh, increase in their dairy herd. In, no, sorry, there's been a huge increase in their dairy herd over the last five years. It's madness. Um, so we do need to take action on this. Um, see if anybody can recognise where that is. So, transport. <laughs> um, uh, the way forward. The government uh, has uh, produced a report, and so has the Climate Change Committee, made recommendations both 2018 and 19 on, on what should be done. These are some uh, suggestions from, from there, uh, and also uh, some of my own. Uh, I cannot understand why every house in the UK does not have solar panels on it. We've seen this great impact that the solar panels have had, and it, it is now much cheaper to produce them. Why isn't the government making solar panels on a huge scale and putting them on every single roof? Uh, we, we need to be doing that. Why, uh, one of the reasons why transport has not changed is that uh, we've, it's, well, we've been going to electronic cars, uh, people have been getting cars that are bigger. They've increased uh, over the last few, uh, over the last decade, the number of large cars has increased dramatically in SUVs. That is, again, madness. Um, Titan emission reductions. I should look at it here, it'd be easier if I can look at you at the same time. Um, well, everybody says encourage walking and cycling. It's not so easy when it's pouring with rain in Plymouth, but, uh, but we, we can have the better <coughs> light vehicle. Uh, expand and subsidise public transport rather than roads. It, it's time to stop building new roads, I think. We need to instead increase public transport everywhere. Um, I, really irritates me when I, I go into shops and I see how far products have been coming, and particularly food. Uh, vast quantities are coming in by plane, and that has the, an enormous impact on, uh, on the levels of, uh, of CO2 that we're producing. This shows you the different sources for the renewable energy. Um, onshore wind, the major source. Mm. And we have in Cornwall the very first um, onshore wind power system. And it's producing a great amount of electricity. We should have more of those. I know there are objections, but when you realise what could happen to your and my grandchildren in the future, I think uh, this is more important, that we have cheap ways. With hydroelectric power, there's hardly any use of that in the UK. We could produce hydroelectric power virtually on every stream in the country in small quantities. We're not using it. Uh, and there should be district schemes uh, facilitated by the government to be able to do that. As I said, the um, amount of the cost of solar energy absolutely dropped dramatically since 1975. Uh, it, here, when the, first, the UK first started to bring them in, all the solar panels were being produced in, in China. Why didn't the UK instead build factories here and produce them in large quantities? And turn off the lights. This is Europe from a satellite. Um, and you can even see the, the oil platforms and gas platforms in the North Sea, the amount of light and energy that they are producing. So we're not just taking the oil and gas out of the North Sea. We're also, they're also lighting up more than they should do. Uh, we, why have so many street lights? Uh, I stayed with my cousin in Ireland and there were eight street lights outside his house and the, he was the only house there. <laughs> I could, there was a church, so they thought it was really important to have street lights next to the church, I think. 
uh, Scoot Madness. Um, now, this is what we've been talking about in terms of UK's contributions. It's what the UK is producing internally within our boundaries and what we export as products to the rest of the world. This is what, this is what I've been talking about. But it doesn't take the, the, this uh, fantastic reduction that the UK government has been telling us about does not take into account all the products that we buy from other parts of the world. There's about a 37%. If you instead look at our emissions in terms of our consumption, about 37% I think increase over, over here. And that really emphasises how difficult it is going to be to get the reductions that we need to have at zero by 2050. And uh, so, prepare for the future. Adapt uh, as much as we can uh, by changing every single thing that we do. Um, can I have, is there another one on there? Yeah. Oh, we've missed these. Sorry. I forgot about the Stern Review. It's much cheaper, before I come on to that, to do and to take action now. Stern demonstrated this in 2006. Next one. Yeah, here we are. And the next. I think we've been missing these some, somewhere along the line. Sorry. Um, adapt to everything. Change everything. And some final conclusions. Wide range of impacts, um, important interactions between population growth, resources and climate. I think the prognosis for 80 years, when I first produced this slide, it was for 100 years, over 20 years ago. I've had this slide for 20 years now, giving it in talks. Um, slide changes to it only. Uh, major economic benefits, going back to the Stern Review, if we take action now. We're, we're stewards of the world, and the Pope really demonstrated that in his encyclical. If you want a world that's worth living in for your grandchildren, then you need to act now. And the poor particularly, and the vulnerable, and people in third world countries are particularly going to be impacted. And one final slide, if I can, which has just come off, hot off the press only about an hour ago, uh, sent to me by, by my partner. Uh, this has just come out, a new report showing climate pledges, what the world is doing. And according to this report, Europe is doing okay. And that's because of the EU. Um, because the EU is guaranteed, has put a policy forward that is going to have major reductions. And each country will be fine. Ireland will receive a fire of fine of £269 million pounds next year because it will not have met its commitments to the, to the EU. We have, primarily because we've reduced one part of our emissions, but only a tiny part of the total. Look, look at the major USA, Brazil, Australia and New Zealand, amazingly, they are huge sources and need to do something. And Russia isn't even taking any notice. So when you take all of that into account, we've got to reduce here in the UK as the major contributor originally to everything. And that's my talk. Thank you very much.